I, I don't know about you guys, but I was very, very moved by those talks. Thanks to everybody who did that. I find it really hard to follow that. Um, but while, while I was listening to what everybody talked about, I was thinking, trying to think about themes that they brought up that actually go along with what I'm going to talk about. And I think for me as, as a physician and not as a survivor, there were a couple of themes that I thought um, resounded for me. One of them was finding the right doctor. Um, and not just, maybe not just the smartest doctor or the doctor who knows the most science or the doctor who has the best lab, but the doctor who you can really connect with, who you can talk to, and who will listen to you. Um, and then the other thing I got out of those stories was that everybody's cancer was different and everybody's experience is different. And I think that's actually going to segue really nicely into what I'm going to talk about with recurrent disease because I think that one of the most important messages I can give you besides hope, which we've already heard about, and we know that there's a lot of hope with all the really smart Dr. Beers in the world that are going to figure out a cure for ovarian cancer, um, is that everybody's cancer is different, not just genetically, because we know that cancers are genetically different, but the host, you, the woman, is different. And the way each host responds to each cancer is different. And so each individual's experience is going to be different. So I'm not going to give you a recipe for how everybody's cancer should be managed, but I'm going to try and synthesize some of the ideas that we already heard this morning into an overall gestalt about how we approach recurrent disease, if that makes sense. And I'm going to intersperse a few um, examples, some of which you've already heard about today. So I'll ask you, when I get to them, have you heard enough about this? Do you want me to skip it? And you, you can let me know about that. Um, but this list is by all means not meant to be exhaustive. We all know that there are multiple different treatments for recurrent ovarian cancer, and I'm just going to touch on a few. We just had our big ASCO meeting that Dr. Does everybody know what ASCO is? Yes? It's the American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's this huge meeting that we have in Chicago every year. I love Chicago. I like New York, but I like Chicago too. Um, in June, where we hear about all the really fantastic new scientific advances that people have been doing over the past year. So I'll allude to a couple of those like Dr. Beer did, but it, there's no way I can cover everything in, in half an hour. Um, so anyway, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I'm not from there though, in case you couldn't tell. I'm from Boston and I actually went to school here, so I really love coming back here. Thank you, Dr. Blank, and thank you to the foundation for inviting me to talk today. Um, Charlottesville, Virginia is in the middle of nowhere, but we have a great, does anybody, has anybody ever been there? Oh, good. Um, but we have, the University of Virginia is an academic um, cancer center. We have um, four G1 oncologists and we do a lot of clinical trials. We have a really terrific cancer center and so you're going to hear my bias, which we already heard this morning and which I think um, we've heard about a lot today is this idea about clinical trials getting opportunities for yourselves for new treatments, but also giving us opportunities to learn more about this disease. So some of the basic themes that I'm going to touch on, I'm going to really try and synthesize all of the things we've heard about this morning. Um, when the disease comes back, what do we do and how do we decide, and when I say we, I don't just mean the physician, I mean the physician and the patient together, what to do. When do we restart treatment? This is a moving target. We, it's not necessarily the right thing to start treatment right away when the CA125 goes from 21 to 44. It might not be the right time to start. When is the right time to start? We don't know, and for each patient it might be different. What are we expecting from treatment? You heard one of the women earlier talk about her hopes with each recurrence that she had. What was she hoping for? Complete remission, stable disease, relief of symptoms, what are our goals of treatment? Really important to start out knowing what those are. What is the best first choice? Somebody asked Dr. Beer a question at the break earlier. How do you treat recurrent disease when it comes back? How do you choose? Well, I make a choice with, together with the patient based on her goals of treatment and what, where she is in her life and what side effects she is and is not willing to tolerate. So what one woman might have as her first line for recurrent disease might be very different than what another woman has. Um, do we do two drugs or do we do one? Nobody really knows. Um, and where does surgery fit in? We alluded to this a little bit earlier. I'm gonna try and touch a little bit on all of these, but obviously we could spend all day talking about this. So if you have questions at the end, did Dr. Beer offer his email at the beginning? Yeah, you can please feel free to email me. I'm, you can find me online. I don't find email invasive, I'm addicted to it. 
So if you'd like to email me questions, that, that would be absolutely fine. These are my kids. They hate it when I do this. I really, I re so my oldest daughter is the one with the long blonde hair on the left. She just graduated high school, which is making me feel really old. I have four kids, which people say is a little crazy. Um, but anyway, they were synchronized skaters when we were in Boston. Does anybody know what synchronized skating is? Yes? It's kind of a really weird sport. It's when you get 20 skaters and you dress them exactly like they're supposed to look exactly alike and they skate across the ice and they do beautiful, beautiful things. You're not supposed to be able to tell one skater from the other. So that's them on the left supposedly looking exactly the same. And then on your right, you can see that they're actually two very different, oh my God, very different um, human beings who look very different. And I use this example and I know Dr. Beer talked about this earlier. This is a very simplified version of what Dr. Beer said. All ovarian cancers are not the same. And not only that, if we take the most common ovarian cancer, the serous subtype, and I show you two photomicrographs of what they look like under the microscope, they look exactly the same. But if we look at their genes, as Dr. Beer told us, they look wildly different. And so we really can't expect one cancer to respond to treatment in the same way as another one does. You, you just can't. And the other piece of it that's really hard to understand is the host, and when I say host, I mean patient woman with cancer, response to that disease. How do you account for that woman's immune system, that woman's state of health, what we in the science call the tumor microenvironment, where the tumor is living? These are things that are really impossible to look at in the test tube. But these are really important interactions with the cancer itself. So that's why each woman's ovarian cancer is going to behave differently. And this is the idea behind personalized cancer care. The idea that we can genetically sequence your tumor and tell you which drugs your tumor is going to respond to, well, that's great. But we're really not at a place yet where we can tell you, you, your immune system is going to respond in this way to this problem. We're going to get there. I have no doubt that we will. There's some really smart people looking at this idea of tumor microenvironment and host response. We're going to get there. The other point I want to make with recurrent, this is my mother and my grandmother. <laughs> my family really doesn't like my slides. Um, I have two sons, too, and they get left out of this. But I talk about them when I talk about the HPV vaccine. Um, each, each, patient with ovarian, <laughs> each patient with ovarian cancer has different goals. And we heard about some of those goals from the survivors earlier today. Your goal if you're 60 is going to be very different than your goal if you're 85, if you're 85 right? And we were ta when you talk about statistics for ovarian cancer, the other thing I tell my patients is, look, those statistics are averages that go from women who are 17 years old to women who are 90 years old. You, there's no way that you can apply those statistics to an individual woman. You can't. Your survival rate, if you're a survivor, is 100%. Who cares what the average survivor rate is, right? That's taking all comers and women who have different goals of care, women who are willing to undergo different sorts of treatments and different toxicities. The woman who's 90 years old on the left, there are certain things that she, her body just will not tolerate that she cannot do that the woman on, sorry, on the right, the woman on the left will tolerate a lot more. So it really depends on what your goals are, what your quality of, we heard quality of life. If I couldn't get up and run every morning, I think I would have to kill my husband. Running is my Valium. If I couldn't do that, if I had such bad neuropathy that I couldn't run, that would really bother me. That's me personally. It may not be you. But you have to be able to talk about those things with your doctor because we can choose a drug or a regimen that will not cause neuropathy if you tell us that that's important to you. And then I alluded earlier to this idea of not treating right when the CA125 goes up. I know you guys heard a lot about CA125 earlier. CA125 is just one piece of the puzzle. We heard um, from a woman who said her CA125 never got to normal, and yet here she is still in remission. It's just a piece of the puzzle, and it's something that we hang on to and that means a lot to us, but it has to be put into context with the clinical situation, the CAT scan, what we can see on the CAT scan, and your symptoms. If you have symptoms, it's a whole lot more meaningful to me than if your CA125 is elevated. Ladies with clear cell ovarian cancer, their CA125 never goes up. Is there anybody in the room with clear cell ovarian cancer? So you know that CA125 is a terrible marker for that disease. It ne some women never have an abnormal CA125. So we have to take all of these things into consideration when we think about when to start treatment for somebody. 
Okay, and that's why if you go see three different doctors, you're gonna get three different answers. And then finally, when I talk to somebody about management of recurrent disease, you heard performance status mentioned earlier. Does, do people know what that means? Yes? No. no, okay. So performance status is a measure that we doctors use to tell us how well you're going to do with treatment. Performance status of zero means that you can get out of bed every day, you can brush your teeth, do your hair, make breakfast, go to work, all that kind of stuff. And then as the performance status goes up, one, two, three, four, and five, your ability to do all those things goes down, okay? To the point where when your performance status is four, you're spending more than half of your time in bed. We know that women who have a good performance status are going to do much better with treatment than women who have a poor performance status. So performance status is really, really important to us in determining how well you will do a treatment. Nutritional status, that was alluded to earlier, really important. Nutrition is very important. You don't have to give up sugar. You can eat ice cream. You can drink wine if that's what you like to do. You need to do, um, nutrition is a, a, about moderation to me, getting enough protein. Sometimes that's hard when you can't eat or when you're feeling sick or if you have a partial bowel obstruction. But maintaining nutrition, really important in order to do well with treatment. And finally, quality of life really, really important. And each woman has a different level of quality of life that's important to her. Um, this is a picture of me and one of my patients. I get very close to my patients in case you can't, can't tell. I get a little attached to some of them. Mary Magnin was a patient of mine in Boston when I was at Mass General. Her husband was also an artist. We heard from an artist earlier. He um, took all of those photographs of her that you see on, on your right, my left, um, wearing different wigs bald, hats. She was all about quality of life and enjoying life even during treatment and documenting that for other women with art, through art. And you're going to see some of his other art throughout my slides. So what I'd like to do just briefly is talk about each of these options. Again, I, this is not meant to be comprehensive. I can't possibly cover everything. But just to give you some ideas of what I think about um, when I'm talking to a patient about recurrent disease, First on my list is always observation, and I know that's scary. But sometimes observation or a treatment break, it can also be called, is the right thing to do. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in, with my next slide. Hormones, there are hormone treatments that work in the recurrent setting that can be non-toxic. Chemotherapy, biologics, and by biologics I mean the drugs that you've heard about, like the enzyme blockers, Avastin or Bevacizumab, the PARP inhibitors, et cetera, that are not chemotherapy. Um, surgery, clinical trials, which we've heard a lot about, and alternative medicine. So when a woman is in, I, I have a story that I just want to tell you. I have a woman who I've been taking care of for a long time who has stage four ovarian cancer. Um, and about a year ago, she had some disease in her abdomen that we could see on her CAT scan, but she had absolutely no symptoms and she felt fine. And she had a lot of things going on in her life. Her daughter was um, doing bad things, and her parents needed to get moved into retirement. And we decided to do an observation period to see exactly what her cancer would do. And she's now been in observation for almost two years. No treatment, and her cancer has been absolutely stable. And that, you know, that sometimes happens. And it's scary to not have treatment. I actually have her come see me once a month just to check in because she has a lot of other social issues, and we just talk just to make sure that she doesn't have any new symptoms, that nothing new is going on. But I guarantee you, if I had been treating her with chemotherapy, I would have credited the chemotherapy for that stable disease. And in fact, this is the natural way that her cancer behaves. Now, I'm not saying that will happen for everybody, but sometimes observation is important to get an idea of what that cancer is going to do without an intervention. Each cancer is going to grow at its own individual rate that may or may not be affected by treatment, and that's really important to remember. For me also, the other thing that's important to remember is the symptoms, and I alluded to this earlier, are the most important thing. If you have a teeny tiny spot on your CAT scan and you're having terrible symptoms, that's a lot more important to treat than if you have a big spot up by your diaphragm and no symptoms. Because the idea in the recurrent, in, when disease comes back, is to make sure that women live as long and as well as possible, either with disease or hopefully in another remission. And if you're not having any symptoms, sometimes there's no point in introducing, you know, potential side effects from chemotherapy just to make the cancer go away when it's not really bothering you or doing anything. 
And that's a hard concept to wrap your head around, but particularly until we find a cure for this disease, an important one, because you don't want to use all your best options right up front. You want to save them maybe for later on. And finally, the risk of the tumor growing and causing symptoms has to be weighed against the risk of treatment. I don't know if anybody talked about hormones this morning. I missed the early talk because the rain got me in really late um, last night, and I decided to actually sleep until 7. My kids think I'm crazy because I get up at 5 every morning, so to me, 7 is late. Um, there are a lot of hormones that work against ovarian cancer, and the remarkable thing about them is they're very non-toxic. So when I say non-toxic, I mean they have very few side effects. So tamoxifen, for example, which I'm sure you've heard of for breast cancer, does have response rates in ovarian cancer. And so um, sometimes if my patients are not comfortable with an observation period, we'll do tamoxifen instead um, and sometimes see a response. These other um, hormones that I've listed here, some of them you may have heard of used in breast cancer, also sometimes we can see responses in ovarian cancer from these medicines. Thalidomide is one that's been around for a long time. It's really hard to get, but um, it has been shown to have some um, activity in ovarian cancer. Chemotherapy, of course. These are the drugs that are FDA approved. But how do you choose which one to use? And how do you decide whether to use them in combination, what order to use them in? Liposomal doxorubicin is doxol. Paclitaxel is taxol. These drugs are all approved, and there are others that we can use off-label, as has been alluded to earlier. They're all out there. They're all available. Um, Stephanie and I, Stephanie hasn't been around as long as I have, but when I first did my fellowship um, and my residency, we didn't have these medicines. We had topo -tican. That was it. That's all we had. We have lots and lots of options now to offer patients. Dr. Beer alluded to this idea of platinum sensitivity and resistance. Do people know what that is? Yes? Does everybody know what that is? No. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a crash course in this. So what I'm gonna tell you is this. Plat this idea of platinum resistant and platinum sensitive is purely for us doctors to stick you in categories, okay? So if somebody tells you that your cancer is platinum resistant, that doesn't mean that your cancer won't ever respond to platinum, okay? It just puts you into a category. Does that make sense? I, I'm gonna explain. We use these categories to triage people into clinical trials, and I'm gonna explain why we do that. But it's not scientific, and it's not, it doesn't really mean that your cancer is platinum resistant. So if you look at this little graph that I stole from somebody else, you know, all of we doctors know each other and we steal slides from each other. So sometimes you see, see these slides multiple times. If you go into remission and your cancer comes back within six months of finishing therapy, you fit into the platinum resistant category. And again, it's a category. That's all it is. It doesn't mean that your cancer won't ever respond to platinum again. I've had people in the platinum resistant category who have responded to platinum later on. So I want you to remember that. If your cancer grows during treatment, you're in this platinum refractory category. If you go six months or more before your cancer comes back, you're in the platinum sensitive category. And I think you guys all have this slide so you'll be able to go back and look at it so that it'll make sense to you. Um, and if your cancer, if you go 18 months, you're really, really sensitive. So those are the categories that we use. So if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is a great website, by the way, and you wanna look for um, clinical trials for yourself, you put recurrent ovarian cancer and then you put platinum resistant or sensitive based on which category you fit in and then you'll find those um, studies that you're eligible for because we all know these clinical trials have eligibility criteria and what that means is you have to fit into a certain category to be able to go on the study. That's really what this is about. Does that make sense? If you have questions about that, please email me. The traditional paradigm here in the olden days, this is another old slide, if you fit into this platinum resistant category, you get treated with something other than platinum. And Dr. Beer was alluding to this a little bit earlier. If you fit into the platinum sensitive category, we treat you with platinum plus something. This has been our paradigm for years and years and years. But I, I wanna stress this to you, it doesn't mean if you're in the platinum resistant category that your tumor will automatically respond to platinum and it doesn't mean if you're in the platinum sensitive category then you're, that your 
um, tumor will respond to platinum. Now, these are not survival rates. These are response rates, okay? And this is why the categories to us as doctors are important. Women who fit into the platinum sensitive category, the yellow bar, have higher response rates to the drugs that we have now than women who fit into the platinum resistant or the white bar. So the platinum resist, the patients in the platinum resistant category are the ones that we are gonna put on trials of brand new drugs because we know that the drugs we have don't work so well. Whereas women in the platinum sensitive group, we may give you a medication that we're pretty sure you'll respond to plus something else. So this is purely for us as researchers and to triage people into clinical trials. So how can we get around this idea of platinum resistance? So I'm gonna go through a couple of ideas about how we might do that. One way we can do that is by reformulating old drugs. So Nectar 102 is a drug that was very, uh, all the newspapers at, at ASCO last year were, were all about this one. This is an old drug called Arenotecan, which is used to treat colon cancer, and they stuck it in a little liposome or a little fat package. So it's liposomal Arenotecan. And they gave that to patients who fit into the platinum resistant category and saw very, very high response rates. Now, if you look, the response rates in this study were as high as 47%. And if you look back on this slide, um, the response rates in this category are far, far lower. For topo tecan, which is a cousin of arena tecan, 12%. Now we're up to 47%. So you can take an old drug and teach it new tricks. That's one option. The other thing, and I think we heard about this earlier from one of our survivors, is to take an old drug and give it in a different way. So we take Taxol and we give it weekly. We're pretty sure it works differently when you give it weekly. And in fact, if you give it weekly to women with this category platinum resistant disease, the response rates are much higher. So we can take old drugs that we already have and give them by a different schedule. We can use new combinations. This combination was also talked about very much at ASCO last year. Instead of giving you paclitaxel and carboplatin, we can give you doxel and carboplatin. And this was a randomized phase three study that was presented at ASCO last year or two years ago. They, the investigators thought that doxel and carboplatin would be less toxic, and indeed it was. There was much less toxicity and no hair loss. But what they also found, surprisingly, was an improved progression-free survival. What progression-free survival means is the amount of time before the disease comes back. So this became our new standard. What about other more exciting, more sexy things than chemo? Well, there are novel approaches to treatment, some of which we've heard about already today. We can target the cancer cell's special machinery. We can block the cancer cell's ability to sustain itself. We can target chemotherapy resistance. We can target the immune system. And I think somebody, um, one of the survivors mentioned going on a vaccine study. These vaccine and immune studies are, were very, very um, big at ASCO this year. People looking at ways to influence the host or the woman to try and get her immune system to fight the cancer. And we can change the method of administration. You guys have heard a lot about bevacizumab today probably. Bevacizumab blocks the tumor cell's ability to, to recruit new blood vessels. If you can't recruit new blood vessels, you die because you can't get nutrition, not you, the tumor. Um, and so if we can target the tumor and keep it from being able to recruit new blood vessels, then it can't grow. Bevacizumab, pazopinib, which somebody asked a question about earlier, all of those drugs work by doing that. The PARP inhibitors target the ability of the cancer cell to repair its DNA, and there are lists and lists and lists, some of which Dr. Beer mentioned, of other enzymes, or we call them abs and ibs. Um, the ibs are inhibitors and the abs are antibodies, just so you know, in case you're reading through these things and you're wondering what all these words are, to either inhibit or have an antibody against a receptor that will turn the cancer cell off. And this is, um, I think I'll probably skip this, this is just a veg bev bevacizumab or a Vastin slide showing you that the tumor secretes vascular endothelial growth factor to try and bring new blood vessels to it, and that's what bevacizumab blocks is that vascular endothelial growth factor. Of course, it also blocks it in your body as a whole, so if you have a wound, it won't heal. Or if you have, um, you, you know, and, and we don't know why it causes high blood pressure, but it does, and we have no idea what the mechanism of that is. So clearly it's doing other things that we're not entirely sure what they are. Um, bevacizumab, as you know, is used both at the time of diagnosis. If you go on a clinical trial, you might get bevacizumab. It's used as maintenance therapy after primary therapy. 
we can use it in combination or as a single agent in the setting of recurrence. Did everybody understand Dr. Beer's explanation of the PARP inhibitors? Yes, okay. So I'll skip over this except to say that this is a really cool idea. The idea that the cancer cells figure out the chemo damages the DNA, the cancer cell figures out how to fix the DNA using PARP, and then what we're doing is directly blocking the cancer cell's ability to fix its DNA. That's very cool. And that is a way of um, reversing chemotherapy resistance because the way the cancer cell is resistant is by fixing the damage that's done by the chemo. Now, there are no PARP inhibitors that are FDA approved, so if you wanted to get a PARP inhibitor off label, we can't do that. But once the PARP inhibitors get FDA approved, then we will be able to prescribe them off label. Whether or not they'll get paid for is another issue. Chemotherapy resistance, I've talked about a little bit. Resistance to upfront treatment, to treatment of recurrent disease, and to platinum. These chemosensitivity testing assays that Dr. Beer talked about a little bit and that there were some questions about, I would agree with what was said earlier this morning that in general those assays are not useful to us clinically, at least not yet. And part of the reason I've already told you is because what they do is they take your tumor cells and they grow them in test tubes. And then they grow them on plates and they give chemotherapy to those plates to see what kills the cells and what don't. Well, guess what? You are not a Petri dish. There is no way for them to take into account this idea of tumor microenvironment. And so it's not entirely clinically useful yet to use those assays. But what Dr. Beer was talking about, this microarray profiling idea, to look to see if we can find genetic signatures to predict drug resistance, that is very interesting. And that right now is at its infancy, but I think in a few years we will be able to tell you, based on the genes in your tumor, whether or not your tumor will respond to a particular medicine. Reversal of drug resistance has been something that we've been looking at for 10, 15 years. Some of the things on these slides are a little bit old, but people have been looking at ways of reversing resistance to Taxol, either with um, this VX710 MDR inhibitor or re reversing resistance to platinum. Again, things that we're working on in the laboratory. And new, com new combinations of old drugs we talked about, but totally new drugs. This is a picture of a C-squirt. <laughs> The C-squirt gives us ET743, which is not approved in the U.S., but which has been shown to have activity in ovarian cancer. There are lots of new molecules being produced every day um, that may have activity in ovarian cancer. And I alluded to this earlier, uh, targeting the immune system is becoming very popular, was very big at ASCO this year, looking at tumor vaccines, so actually vaccinating you against your own cancer, but also looking at ways to um, rev up your immune system against the tumor. And CDX1127 is just one example. If they have letters and numbers, you know they're still in very preliminary levels of testing. Um, it's an antibody that's designed to activate the immune cells against the cancer. Much of this immune work is being done in melanoma, but a lot of it is translatable into ovarian cancer and other solid tumors as well. Um, anybody, ha we were talking about IP therapy earlier. Has anybody had it? So I would agree with what the other said. At my institution, we have no problem getting people through six cycles of IP chemo. We give it as an outpatient. We're very um, good at it. But it is something that you do need to have experience with to be good at. This is a picture of us in the operating room putting an IP port in. I think we've gotten very good at putting them in and managing the complications. Um, and in general, people are able to tolerate intraperineal chemotherapy very well. We can give chemotherapy by mouth. It actually works really well that way or we can inject it directly into the tumor. And I'm just going to show you an example of that. This is a, these are slides from a paper from Mass General. Actually, I, I didn't mention that I was at Mass General for 13 years and left exactly when Dr. Beer got there. Had nothing to do with him. <laughs> um, anyway, on, on panel A, you can see that this patient has an isolated liver metastasis. The arrow, I don't know if you can see it, but the arrow is pointing to it. Um, on panel B, there's a needle being placed directly into that lesion, and it's being treated with something called radiofrequency ablation. Very high-pitched sound waves are being used. In panel C, you can see actually that they didn't just kill that little bit of cancer, but they also killed a little bit of liver around it. That's what that big cystic space is. And then on panel D, one and a half years later, you can see the liver looks completely normal. It's healed over, and the lesion is gone. So these are things that people are doing. You can also do this with focused ultrasound. You can do this with other um, modalities. 
to treat certain things like this, again, you'd have to go to an academic center, but these are examples of ways, rather than treating your whole body, of treating the lesion directly. And then finally, and I've totally run out of time, but I just want to touch on surgery. When is surgery the right thing for recurrent disease? We, we know that surgery is always the right thing for primary disease. In our community in G1 Oncology, this is pretty controversial, and we don't really know the right answer to this. And I think that it's important for you, if you think surgery might be an option for you, to at least bring it up with your doctor and discuss it. Um, but there are, the benefit seems to be particularly to women who have, had, who have been, had a long remission, at least 12 months, have an isolated or maybe one or two spaces on the CAT scan where we can see your cancer and where your surgeon thinks the cancer can be completely removed. You certainly don't want to go to the operating room and have your doctor do a big surgery and say, I'm really sorry I put you through this big surgery and I couldn't take it all out. So really important is to choose the right doctor to have the conversation, bring it up, and to say, hey, is surgery an option for me? Because it has been shown in certain individuals that surgery can really increase the amount of time between remissions. And finally, complementary therapy. We need somebody to come talk about this at length. I don't have time to talk about this. This cartoon says, quit complaining and eat it. Number one, chicken soup is good for the flu, and number two, it's nobody we know. Um, <laughs> I, I to me, complementary therapy um, includes a whole lot of things like acupuncture, yoga, exercise, really important. We know that exercise improves your immune system. We know that. Whatever exercise you can do, even if it's just walking from your kitchen to your living room, like was discussed earlier, really important for your immune system. Nutrition. But also, all of these other things that people do, in general, my advice to you would be, I have two pieces of advice. The first is never spend too much money on it. If it's really, really expensive, it's not worth it. Um, and number two, make sure your doctor knows what you're taking. A lot of the things that people take can interfere with the chemotherapy drugs we give can either um, raise or decrease the levels of the chemotherapy drugs we're giving or make them completely ineffectual altogether. So don't be afraid to tell your doctor what you're taking. Don't think your doctor's going to think you're crazy because we're not. Most of us aren't going to think you're crazy. We just want to know what you're taking so we make sure we're not causing any dangerous interactions with what, you're, what you may be taking. And finally, clinical trials we've heard a lot about, but this is also my spiel. Do a clinical trial if you're eligible. Um, it will, may or may not give you access to a drug that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise, but it will also allow us to learn more about ovarian cancer and to learn more about biology, genetics, and the molecular basis of cancer. So we might ask you, hey, can we draw your blood five times while you're getting this drug because we want to see how your body metabolizes it? Or hey, can we get a little piece of your tumor while you're getting this drug? And all of those things are not just because we're mean. We are, but it's beside that. It's because we want to learn about how that drug is interacting with your tumor, with your microenvironment, with you as the host. So my general take on this, having done this for way too long, is that there's a lot of hope. You, the science you saw from Dr. Beer is unbelievable. And there is a lot of hope that we will be giving individualized medicine, personalized cancer care the way we should be in the future. But for now, Treatment for recurrent disease really needs to be individualized, both to the cancer and to the patient. So the woman in your survivor's group might be getting something completely different than you, and that is okay. The women on the internet may be getting something different than you, and that is okay, because we really try to individualize treatment. There are many options in the recurrent setting, and we heard about second opinions. I think that's a great idea, and any doctor that doesn't want you to get a second opinion is not a good doctor, in my mind. I send my patients to the NCI because that's the closest big place to me. But you guys in New York have a lot of different choices. You can go to a lot of different centers and see what clinical trials other folks are doing. And clinical research is definitely going to increase our options to individualize treatment. In the future, we're working toward personalized cancer care, as you heard. We're working as a group, uh, all of us surgeons as a group across the country, to better define the role of surgery in recurrent disease. And our ultimate goal, of course, as is yours, is the ultimate cure of ovarian cancer and recurrent ovarian cancer. So thank you so much for your attention. And I'm